Welcome to today's national weekly EMS Zoom news briefing. I'm Julian Doe, co-director of Ethnic Media Services and your moderator for today. Today's briefing focuses on community healing, the relentless rise in racial and ethnic hate crimes, the front page news for ethnic media, Atlanta's mass shooting targeting Asian salons, brutal attacks on Asian Americans in the subways and on the sidewalks of New York, targeted shootings of African Americans at a grocery store in Buffalo and a church in Charleston, shootings targeting Jewish worshippers at synagogue and LGBTQ person at Q club, cultural genocides of Native Americans in boarding school and countless attacks against Latino at shopping centers and school. We could go on and on. So the question is, how do people and communities find a way to reconcile with horrific acts perpetrated against them, their families, their communities, let alone the ongoing trauma of structural racism and wars of genocide or state-induced terrorism? Is there a way to heal? What approaches can we share with each other? We are all grappling with these questions as journalists. And today we are honored to have four speakers sharing their perspective, research and live experiences. All agree on one key opponent, the importance of documenting and validating the traumas endured. Our speakers include Helen Zia, author and founder of the Vincent Chin Institute, James Taylor, professor of politics and African-American studies at the University of San Francisco, Beth Wright, staff attorney for Native American Rights Fund and researcher on boarding school, truth and healing, and Nestor Fantini, co-editor at Hispanics LA and also adjunct professor of sociology and former political prisoner in Argentina. We ask our speakers to speak slowly for our interpreters in Spanish, Mandarin, Korean, and we ask reporters to enter questions in the chat. We will send a video of today's briefing and expanded bio with contact information for each speaker to all participants later today. So to start, racial discrimination and biases that lead to hate crimes and incidents against AAPI community are not new. But in recent years, they have taken on new dimensions of heightened political rhetoric and the number of hate crimes and incidents against Asian Americans keep rising. So how can the victims and the community heal when the nightmare is occurring is still occurring and even getting worse. We turn to our first speaker, Helen Zia. Helen, this, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julian. And thank you to EMS for this really important topic. And, uh, and thank you all who are tuning in. Um, uh, it's an honor to be on this panel with the other uh, incredible journalists and uh, co-panelists. And so, um, as Julian was saying, this is a, a time of, of uh, incredible change, um, tectonic shifts that are going on that, in, that unfortunately have involved violence, division, and things that have, um, have resurfaced a lot of the triggering that uh, brings back intergenerational traumas. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, some of the COVID uh, uh, related hate and violence that's happened. Um, you know, the thing about these traumas, even if they are incidents that have happened long ago, um, they continue and, you know, they're absorbed in our, in our, not only in our psyches, but in our bodies. And so when there are incidents of, uh, for example, anti-Asian hate that have happened, um, you know, there was this beginning uh, back in, you know, 2019, actually, when the COVID virus was first identified, the violent assaults against Asian Americans and Asians on every continent 
outside of uh, Antarctica started being documented. And one of the responses was surprise. I mean, oh, how do these things even happen? Um, do Asians in America even experience racism or discrimination of any kind? Is this something new? And even Asian Americans themselves were posting things on um, social media saying, wow, I never knew such a horrible thing could happen to my own children or to my own family. But the point about it is these are not new things at all and why it is so important to document uh, and report on these things because um, even though for some people it was new, for many others, it was triggering um, and not just Asian Americans, but violent incidents and hate of any kind. I mean, we, we have seen how there's a rise in that kind of hate violence and uh, killings that have affected every uh, marginalized community in America. And so um, not, and, and the, the intergenerational trauma goes beyond, um, you know, direct violence as well. We know that immigrants and refugees and the vast majority of Asians in America have come here either as immigrants or refugees, and many in many cases have been fleeing violence. So to find that there is, a, is the um, uncertainty of walking out your door and, and, and possibly being killed or having grandma and grandpa go for a walk and wondering whether they're going to come home at all, or uh, as well as the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans in this society, all of these have been forms of violence that Asians in America have experienced. And so there was nothing new about it. And um, however, we are in a period of, of now three years going on and, and no end in sight, because as long as um, the rhetoric goes on about China and Chinese people, being the uh, existential threat to America, we know that these kind of ha uh, hate attacks and violence are just going to continue. And, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about 1982. Um, that's 41 years ago when there was another pandemic of hate that went on, except back then it was against people who looked Japanese. And a young man named Vincent Chin was uh, killed beaten to death by two white auto workers with a baseball bat. And uh, it was a time when um, China wasn't the enemy. It was, the view was Japan and America should send nuclear bombs back to Japan. And that was in the, in the news, in the um, overall uh, atmosphere every day, a real climate of anti-Asian hate. And this young man, Vincent Chin, was out celebrating his um, bachelor party when the two white auto workers blamed him for the unemployment and the terrible misery uh, that the economic depression in the Midwest was, um, was causing everywhere. And I was a young journalist then in Detroit, and I had been an auto worker as well, and I had been unemployed. So I saw the misery that people were experiencing, but the rhetoric turned the blame to an external enemy, and that was Japan. But internally, that meant that uh, all Asians in America had a target on their heads, and Vincent Chin was beaten to death um, with a baseball bat to his head. And so what about the healing? You know, that was traumatic for all Asians in America, the feeling that we were all possible uh, targets. And I got to know Vincent Chin's mother. I got involved in that to say, what can we do? Because the judge in that case sentenced the two killers who had done this terrible uh, hate killing in front of about 100 other witnesses. So there was no question that they had done it. And the judge said in Detroit, in a depression, in a city that was majority Black and still is, that these are not the kind of men you send to jail and sentenced them to probation. So these two killers actually never spent a single day in jail, but the tra trauma also triggered a great sense of inequality, of injustice. Um, what was that saying for all the black Americans who are being sentenced to long prison sentences for even jaywalking, let alone um, for the Asian American community? What did this mean? So 
So I got to know Vincent Chin's mother and her grief, which has been documented through a, a documentary called Who Killed Vincent Chin, was intense. You know, nothing for victims of violence and, and killings will bring their loved ones back. Nothing will bring people who have suffered violence um, back to, to when they didn't experience that. But what made a difference was a community coming together to acknowledge, to say, to tell the world, this is something that happens to Asian Americans. This was a terrible thing that happened to Lily Chin's son, Vincent, and to then begin to do something about it. So part of my work was documenting that, but also um, being an active agent for change as well, and using my journalistic skills to, to try to um, help the community have their voice heard to have Lily Chin, um, who was willing to speak through her grief and, and really became like a Mamie Till for the Asian American community to say, this happened to my son and this should not happen to any other, uh, any other family, any other child. And so um, what happened was that she and the Asian American community were able to channel their grief through action through trying to make a difference and not just Asian Americans coming together, but reaching out and joining with the black community, black, brown, red, white, and coming together and, and, and actually saying, we stand together against hate and inequality and injustice to any community. And, and actually began to link the understanding of what happened to Vincent Chin and all of the trauma that had gone on hundreds of years to Asian Americans and other people, um, link them together and to say how by standing together, we can actually make change. And so a new civil rights movement was born out of that, but also through the um, ethnic media first, which first publicized this, as well as then the broader uh, media, we were able to bring more attention and the thing about acknowledging recognizing, connecting the dots, showing that this was not just a, a one-off kind of thing, but linking it to history and showing uh, the context to other communities as well. So that was a healing process and the community got stronger. It got stronger in very concrete ways, new organizations, new generations of activists, um, working together against racism, against injustice, against, um, against hate. And that um, that has been resurrected again today. I, I mean, I have to say it never actually went away. But in this new pandemic of hate and violence and naming uh, uh, different communities as the enemy, which, by the way, also divides us, keeps us apart and makes it less possible to actually make change. And it's the change that is healing. So I, I just wanted to share a few slides to show something that the Vincent Chin Institute is doing. We created it after last year's 40th commemoration of the killing of Vincent Chin, because at this time of increased hate toward any group, as well as the increased rhetoric against so many of the different groups, including Asian Americans being the existential threat to America, um, we thought we really needed to share the history of how communities came together to not just document a crime and a, and a pain, but also what people did about it, because we have to do that again and to, to show how our communities can come together. And um, so I wanted to, let's see, am I sharing? Yes, there. So what I wanted to share here was one of the things that the um, Vincent Chin Institute is doing. We put together, a, a booklet, a 70 page booklet. Um, it's available online for free. It's also available for downloads for free. And it tells the story of what happened, the documentation, but also how communities came together, you know, multiracial, cross generational, interfaith. And so we not only did it in English, but we also. Um, had it translated, so why remember Vincent Chin? But we had it translated who is into Spanish, into uh, we 
told the story of the civil rights movement starting in the 1600s and the um, genocide against indigenous people and the enslavement of people from Africa. And we translated it, this, the connections to Asian American history and resistance into Chinese, into Arabic, into Vietnamese, into Korean, as well as Bengali. And, and so the point is, we have to be able to show these um, stories and reach as many communities as possible because that's where the healing will begin. And healing, is, it's, it also means empowerment. You know, if we are injured, we are vulnerable. If we are living with the trauma and the intergenerational pain, um, we cannot make change until we also, healing comes from a place, it is the place where we can make change. And so I, I just wanted to start with that. So um, let me stop here and, and thank you for, for listening. And you can find this uh, on the internet available um, at vincentchin.org. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Helen, for, for sharing uh, the stories and also um, the, uh, the message about um, how one should not um, suffer or, or try to heal alone, but um, it, it takes a village, it takes a community uh, to do so. And, and that is a great segue into our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, uh, James Taylor. So uh, enslavement of another human is truly a crime against humanity. It robs the victims of freedom and dignity. In America, enslavement was actually supported by many state policies and businesses. So how can a community heal from that? Uh, Professor Taylor um, is, is also a member of San Francisco African American Reparations Advisory Committees. Um, so uh, Professor Taylor, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, unmute uh, Professor Taylor. Here I go. Here. Uh, I was saying thank you, Sandy and uh, and Julian, uh, both for having me here. And uh, Helen, uh, her presentation is is a tough act to follow. Um, I, I really learned learned a lot. Um, I I had studied and and taught my students, you know, about Vincent Chin in my classes here in San Francisco. Uh, and so to see that the work is ongoing, um, and to see, for example, the translation. Uh, into these different languages, that's the kind of thing that's needed. That's the kind of solidarity that's needed to break down barriers by helping people understand in their own terms what other groups have um, experienced. And I think, um, you know, greater empathy is something that uh, should be a desired um, um, outcome of, of any kind of work we do uh, re related to healing um, and healing communities. Um, I guess, I, you know, what, what I thought I'd do is just talk briefly about the work I've, we're doing in San Francisco on the San Francisco San Francisco African American uh, Reparations Advisory Committee. Um, uh, as we've been constituted over the last year and a half, um, uh, along with the California Reparations Committee, um, my work in it kind of was connected to um, something in 2006 that San Francisco did under Gavin Newsom uh, called the Slavery Disclosure Ordinance. SDO, uh, and you can look that up online. It's actually um, an annual report um, since 2006, where every corporation in the city has to do a deep dive into their own records and determine any ties to, to, to slavery, um, you know, traditionally, and they could voluntarily put money in a fund here in San Francisco, and that's been in place since 2006. Um, and so we were, you know, the group I was working with, we were way ahead of the game. I mean, again, Gavin Newsom brought us in. Um, it was a group of local San Francisco, Bayview, Hunters Point, Fillmore, uh, Western Edition, community organizations and activists. And ultimately, we produced this, this you know, this piece of, uh, of, of uh, legislation uh, as an ordinance. Um, it was also uh, at the state level, there's a slavery disclosure ordinance. Iowa has one uh, and Los Angeles has one. Uh, but we were hoping that one day the issue of reparations would come and catch up with us. And it finally has uh, 15 years later, uh, after the George Floyd uh, protests and reaction, uh, what we were calling a watershed, um, you know, moment in the country's history around, um, the, you know, the reckoning, as it was being called, reckoning with the past, which kind of implicates that we have some unresolved uh, issues that we've never really confronted. Um, 
reparations, you know, is something I've always thought was the natural outcome of what black people were doing in any movement they've ever developed. Uh, I think everything else is a waste of time. Affirmative action, welfare, that's all a waste of time. It's all piecemeal to, to prevent reparations, um, to stall. Um, what we've done is um, stir the conversation that has changed the game for reparations forever. Uh, we've never gotten this close anywhere. Two days ago, if you look it up, the New York State Legislature adopted a state reparations program committee. So right now, New California and now New York, most people don't know, New York two days ago, and now there are about five other states considering statewide reparations programs. What, what, what reparations is about is, is really about healing and reconciliation um, and fixing the broken, the broken bone, you know, uh, to repair, to repair a people. And the truth is black people in America have always been broken apart from their own deep religious and spiritual culture um, that has kept them alive and kept them thriving. Um, I was listening to the Reverend uh, Frederick K.C. Price, who's now dead. He was a pastor down in Los Angeles um, uh, at the old Pepperdine campus on 79th and Vermont. Uh, and he was talking to his church about how Africans came to this country completely naked with nothing. And then he and he was a millionaire at the time. And he talked and he wasn't a prosperity type preacher. Uh, he just opened it up and said, look at us now. They gave us nothing. And 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 so they, you know, to try to repair, I'm saying they, they you know, they were broken from day one. So we aren't even at the point of can we reach reconciliation or repair? For many, there's a there's a, a denial of recognition that there was ever a, a serious injury. The reaction to our efforts in San Francisco and in California, when we announced the $5 million recommendation to the Board of Supervisors and the mayor was from thousands of people, Fox News, uh, Larry Elder, Leroy Terrell, they found black faces to, to criticize it. None of these people have ever done any serious studies about reparations. They don't know about the Japanese internment and, uh, and, and Executive Order 9066 under FDR. You know who's strongly supportive of black reparations in San Francisco? The Japanese community is. They're the number one supporters of black reparations in San Francisco outside of the black community and the Jewish community is supportive. Those are the two allied groups right now that, and, and, the, and the Japanese community, I wrote an article about the, the treatment of Muslims in California, the police state in reaction to 9-11, and one of the things I discovered there was that the Japanese community was the, 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 the leading community to reach out to Muslims, um, you know, imams, uh, mosques, uh, because they understood what it meant to be um, a targeted minority group. I mean, there was 120,000 Japanese in Hawaii where Pearl Harbor happened, and they didn't get interned, but the 120,000 here in the West Coast were from here to Los Angeles. And that story, I don't think, is still fully understood by most Americans. And the fact that under Korematsu, it's still the law of the land. It could happen again because Korematsu was never turned over. All right. It was in the state. It was fixed, but not at the federal level. Korematsu is still law, a precedent. And um, I think when you talk about, you know, reparations, one of the most important cases is what happened to the Japanese of California. Um, and the West Coast, uh, it becomes, you know, since the 80s when Reagan and Bush, you know, came along with their $20,000 per family, uh, 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 you know, policy, it actually encouraged the black reparations movement to continue on because the black reparations movement, most people don't understand this. It was the original movement of black people. I was cited, I think, in the Washington Post this week saying that the original black politics after abolition was reparations, not integration. Reparations was the focus from the 1880s, the reconstruction period. There was a woman named Callie House. If you look her up on Amazon, there's a book by Mary Frances Berry. I'm sure some of you know who she is, uh, the lawyer, um, the legal scholar. She wrote a book called My Face is Black is True. Uh, it's the story of Callie House, a black woman in Memphis who led 300,000 blacks. Actually, she joined them. She didn't lead them. They were already doing it at the, at the community level. And then she and a pastor joined and they become the leaders of this movement um, uh, eventually. And they sue 
in a case called a McAdoo, I think it's called McAdoo versus Jackson. I, I might be wrong. McAdoo, I'm, I know it's a McAdoo. I'm, I'm a little bit off on the case. Uh, but there was a reparations case that happened. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has ruled on reparations and said that the state is sovereign and the state is immune. Uh, so we're going up against that. Um, but what reparations is supposed to be about and where it came from is goes back to Callie House. Uh, she had a larger following than Martin Luther King. Uh, she sued for seven years as a slave. She sued the United States Treasury for $56 million in 1899. She was arrested and incarcerated by the federal government over some bogus mail fraud that they used later to get rid of Marcus Garvey 30 years later. They use it on Callie House first and then on Garvey. People don't know that. Callie House and Isaiah Dickerson were the two leaders of the movement in, in Memphis. And they used the, the, the rationale was because the federal government at the time, after the war, taxed all of the cotton in the South under the Confederacy. And it was billions of dollars in today's monies. And they were using that money as a, 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 um, a, re, a, a retirement fund for uh, the soldiers, for, for the Union soldiers. And Callie House said, wait a minute, we picked the cotton, not the soldiers who fought the war. That should be ours. And so she sued over the right to that taxed cotton that was Confederate cotton that Black folk picked that the United States federal government otherwise was giving to Union veterans. And so they uh, used Prof to aid Professor type. Taylor. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry uh, if I could interrupt. Um, there's many questions for you. Sure. And um, it, 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 it's okay that we have other speakers um, sure. um, present the remark and then we move all, all of the questions for follow up. Sure. Uh, just, okay. let, me, let me just wrap up then. Uh, I'll wrap up real quickly. Okay. Um, what, what we're doing, California is not about slavery. There was 300 years of slavery here of the Indian people. Uh, and people are ignorant about that. Blacks were enslaved here as well. Uh, and even during the few, the biggest issue for black Californians was the condition of fugitivity, not slavery. Being a fugitive in California, like in Canada, going to Mexico, um, the drug war, segregation, schools, the injury in California is not slavery like it is in Alabama. It's different. It's more nuanced. It's more complicated because the Chinese, the Japanese, um, uh, the Native Indian people all had their own encounters with this same white supremacist reality. Uh, and so just to wrap it up, we've inspired the world. There are 14 countries now talking about reparations. I told you New York yesterday, Boston, Detroit, Oakland, uh, uh, a Berkeley Unified School District, Berkeley City, Sacramento all over the world, like marijuana and gay marriage, they were unpopular local movement issues from California, Oakland, weed, gay marriage, San Francisco. They went from those places as unpopular ideas and spread throughout the world. And that's what reparations is doing now. It cannot be stopped. London Breed can reject it. Gavin Newsom can reject it in California. They can't stop with reparations, the movement. That's going to be where people are going, uh, uh, I think over the next 50 years, pushing for this if they until reparations is fulfilled as a way of healing the broken bones in the black community. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Taylor. Um, I just want to add uh, one quick point is that um, the, the, the reparations to the Japanese community, the Japanese American community um, didn't happen um, without the support of the uh, black uh, community and also the black um, uh, political leadership. Um, to, to our next speaker, um, erasing one's people's culture, identity and language is cultural genocide. It has happened everywhere throughout world history, especially during the colonial period. Studies have shown the people who have suffered cultural genocide the most tend to be indigenous people who are the original and first people of the land that had been taken over. Our next speaker is Beth Wright, who will share with you a case of cultural genocide against Native Americans and how the community has been trying to heal from these atrocities. Uh, please, Beth. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Wright. I'm a staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund in Colorado. I'm going to talk a little bit about NARF's work in boarding school healing, and I'll give a little bit of background on boarding schools themselves. Um, 
So what we call the Federal Indian Boarding School era through the 1970s, where the United States administered an assimilation and what they called a civilization process in federal Indian boarding school policies and practices oh, uh, that were just- uh, Beth, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, your audio is really um, uh, tricky. Um, maybe you could turn off your video and just focus on the audio. I think we may have, may have lost her. Um, in the uh, uh, interest of time, um, we can go back to uh, to Beth uh, to give her uh, um, time to uh, reconnect. Uh, let's go to uh, our next speaker. Um, there, there, there's a huge percentage of people who came to America as a result of wars conflicts and genocide that have occurred in their homelands like El Salvador, Afghanistan, and Cambodia. In my own case, my family became political refugees in America at the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. It's been well documented that many immigrants who have been exposed to war and imprisonment are still living with these trauma even decades later. Our next speaker is Nestor Fantini, who was a prisoner in Argentina during the Dirty War period from 1974 to 83, under the dictatorship of the military hunter. According to Nestor, restorative justice let the world know what happened and telling stories about the victims are one approach to community healing. Uh, Nestor, please. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much for that introduction. And also thank you, Sandy, and all those who, who are part of this very this special meeting. Huh? Before I start, uh, I, please let me share with you that uh, as co-editor of Hispanic LA, along with the uh, founder and co-editor, Gabriel Lerner, who happens to be here as well. Hello, Gabriel. We are part of the Stop the Hate campaign that's uh, being spearheaded by the state of California. Anyway, so when we talk about uh, reconciliation uh, and also restorative justice programs that, that Julian mentioned, uh, we're not only talking about the uh, rational issues. Mm -hmm. We're also, also dealing with many, many emotions, mm -hmm. powerful emotions. So let, let, let me give you some background uh, information about myself uh, and also about Argentina in the 1970s before we get into the restorative the, the, the justice programs. So in, in those days, I was a 22-year-old student at the University of Córdoba and also a worker at the ICA Renault. And, and I was arrested for my political activities. Although I was never charged, never charged with anything, I was tortured in the Departamento de Informaciones Dos in Córdoba and kept in different political prisons for four years, in three different political prisons throughout the, the years. And in 1977, I was adopted as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International, who only a few years ago came up with a video of my experience in those days in Argentina. That's uh, online, by the way. So, in March 1976, uh, a little background here, uh, the military stage a, a coup d'etat in Argentina. Uh, they arrested the president, they, they, they closed down the, the, the Congress, replaced members of the Supreme Court. Uh, and that was not a, a dirty war. That was a pure state terrorism. These dissidents were kidnapped. They were taken to more than 360 concentration camps, huh? Centro de Detención Clandestina. And they were systematically tortured and as many as 30,000 disappeared. In other words, I mean, they were executed. Prisoners were dragged and thrown from planes into the Atlantic Ocean. In uh, around 500 babies, 500 babies were appropriated by the military. So let me pause for a second and, and tell you about uh, July 5th, 1976. And, and of course there were many July 5th in that year, 
where, where I was. Uh, that was probably the worst year in, in terms of my experience and the experience of many other the, the, that were in political prisons. Huh? And I, I was uh, in, in the political prison of Cordoba uh, that was under the jurisdiction of General Luciano Benjamin Mendo Menendez, one of the most cruel uh, generals uh, during the, this uh, experience. Uh, when suddenly armed soldiers came into the pavilion, uh, into the area of the prison where we uh, were held, uh, into the cells. So they came making noises, yelling, uh, and, 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 and knocking at the cells, the doors. Um, and, and they, they took us to, to the yard, to the prison yard. About 50 of us were taken to the prison yard. And, and we were there, it, it was in the middle of the winter, it was uh, very cold, those Argentinian winters are quite cold. And uh, we were completely naked, completely naked and standing against the walls at an angle uh, with our hands up like that in our head it, at an angle that was almost impossible really. Yeah? It was a very uncomfortable position. And the soldiers would walk around the yard beating us with uh, rubber sticks. Uh, and at some point that's when a fellow political prisoner uh, Raul Bauduco, we used to call him Paco, uh, Paco Bauduco. He was a young uh, journalist uh, student. He fell to the ground and he fell to the ground. And then a non-commissioned officer uh, came uh, and, and actually uh, started to order him to get up. Uh, the name of this non-commissioned officer, as we found out uh, much later, was uh, Miguel, is Miguel Angel de Perez. And when Bauduco couldn't get up because he, he was he practically fainted, then he, he, he Paris walked towards the, the center of the yard where the officer who was in charge of the operation, <laughs> Lieutenant de Monese Ruiz, actually the, talked to him and gave him an order. So the Paris walked back to where the Paco was, pointed the, the gun to his head and shot him. Yes, shot him in front of all of us. Again, I mean, we were between 40 and 50 uh, political prisoners there. And he shot him, and of course, Paco died almost immediately. And then Pablo Balustra, and then Hugo Baca Narbaja, and Florencio Diaz, and René Mocarce, and the list continues of all those who were killed in the political prison of Cordoba, UP1 under the jurisdiction of General Menendez in 1976, 31 political prisoners. I was on the trial in, in 2010, July 2010, when President Videla was there, former President Videla, uh, General Menendez, and 28 more uh, military officers who were in many, in many instances, 26 of them were found uh, guilty of crimes against humanity. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I strongly support reconciliation. I strongly support reconciliation. Let me emphasize that. And also restorative justice problems because they are a humane alternative to a very dysfunctional criminal justice system, especially the one that we have here in the US huh? with more than 2 million people in prison uh, with uh, institutional racism that uh, leads to about 60% of the prisoners being from members of uh, minority groups, African-Americans, Latinos, with a recidivism rate of uh, about 77%. How, we, how could we not support restorative justice uh, programs that are a true alternative to punishment, to revenge? However, and let me also emphasize that however, one size fits all programs and initiatives, in my personal opinion, do not work. Reconciliation in Mandela, South Africa, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, may have been a relatively successful alternative, no doubt, at least in, in creating political stability in that country. But in Argentina, we're talking of different historical circumstances. And if we go to Larry Siegel, a criminologist that talks about the restorative justice programs, there are three prerequisites for this restorative process and reconciliation to succeed. And one that's fundamental is that the offender needs to acknowledge the harm that he or she had caused. In another one, 
is that the offender should actually provide material restitution and symbolic reparation. In Argentina, in every single trial, in every single trial that took place since 1985, the offenders refused to acknowledge their guilt. They refused to provide information about the whereabouts of the 30,000 disappeared and the whereabouts of the 500 babies that were appropriated. There's no acknowledgement. There's no shame. There's no apology. Marta Mino, and she's a brilliant human rights scholar who, who teaches at Harvard, uh, talking about uh, reconciliation, she focuses on two dimensions, one being the state, the other one, the individual. In the state, of course, uh, as the embodiment of rational society, has a responsibility to address the harm caused to society. Crimes against humanity cannot, cannot and should not go unpunished. However, when it comes to the individual, it becomes a different story. And to finish, let me share what the Mino say about the individual in a conference in South Africa. Quote, only the individual who suffered the harm has the authority to forgive. Nobody but him. Forcing a victim to make a certain decision is to revictimize the victim. The state can judge, but only the individual can forgive, unquote. So for many in Argentina, for key institutions, including the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, there could be no reconciliation no forgiveness until, until the military acknowledge their crimes, and also until they disclose the whereabouts of the 30,000 disappeared and the 500 babies that only about 132, I believe, have been recovered. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, 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 uh, Nestor. Um, uh, Beth, um, uh, are you back online? Uh, are you? Uh, uh, here um, joining us. Um, it seems that she hasn't been able to lock back on, uh, but um, in the interest uh, of time, um, I uh, was fortunate to have a, a good conversation uh, with Beth. And what she wanted to share with the audience today um, was that, and I first heard about the boarding school issues uh, when Pope Francis uh, visited uh, Canada last year to issue a public apologies to the atrocities that the states and also the church complicit in, in robbing um, the culture and, and identity of, of, uh, of many um, indigenous people. And this had happened, as I read on, it, it happened uh, around the world um, in, in, in America as well in Australia and New Zealand. And um, last year, I also participated at the Native American uh, Journalism Conference. And there, there was a uh, presentations about how it happens and, and what the, uh, the communities, uh, Native American community across the country um, have been trying to, to do ever, ever since is, is to um, repatriate uh, the identities, uh, the, the children back to their uh, tribes. Because when, when these children were kidnapped and placed in this boarding school, it, it, they basically rob many of these tribes of their cultures, uh, their, their language their, and their identity. So part of the community healing is, is about restoring the tribes, their identity and also the culture and also uh, the, the, uh, the languages uh, as well. So with that, um, I would now, now like to start um, asking um, our audience uh, to ask their questions. And uh, in the chat, um, we have a question from uh, Henrietta uh, Burrow. Uh, Henrietta, um, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, I guess the first question is to Helen. And with the Emmett Till case, there was a follow-up in terms of the murderers and the woman who was the original accuser. Um, so 
as awful as the crime was against the Chin family, did anyone follow what happened to the killers? And even is it possible now to appeal that decision and bring them to justice? Thank you, Henrietta, for that question. Um, when the community organized, there was a great deal of effort to try to um, bring the case to justice in the sense that we tracked the entire <clears throat> failure of the uh, of the initial criminal prosecution all the way that led to the to the um, probation sentence. And uh, and then the, the civil rights movement that emerged called for a civil federal civil rights investigation, which led to a federal civil rights trial. Um, 40 years ago, for a killer to say, it's because of you mother Fs that we're out of work and point to an Asian American and say that and then kill him, or to say, let's get the Chinese to a jury in Cincinnati that wasn't enough to establish a racial motive. It uh, because there was no racial slur. And when you think about like what are commonly accepted racial slurs or uh, that the average juror might recognize as racial motivation, I mean, you know, um, basically, so the civil rights prosecutions took place, <clears throat> the juries acquitted the two men of, of violating Vincent Chin's civil rights. And so they were then scot-free. What followed up then was, um, uh, the civil suit where for the wrongful death of Vincent Chin and there were financial penalties um, laid on the men and um, and let me just say that the one who actually wielded the bat and beat Vincent Chin's brains into the street fled to Nevada which has very protective laws for debtors and so yes there has been follow through we know exactly where the killer lives um, um, when, when Vincent's mother passed away, she named me as executor for her, her estate, which means that um, we are, have been for the last 40 years keeping track of the, you know, this particular man. And, um, and so there may be no actual restitution in the way that um, Professor Taylor and, and Professor Fantini were talking about. Uh, in, in terms of even acknowledging, um, let alone providing some sort of material sign of, of, of remorse. But the follow through from the community is to say that this man will never have a day of his life go by without knowing that, that the judgment against him still exists. Um, the community and the family is still waiting for um, some sign of, of, of true remorse from him. But other than that, he will never have a day of uh, go by without being reminded of the debt he owes to, the, to society as well as to the family. And, and that's the best we can do at this point besides keeping, keeping the story and the documentation alive and, and um, relaying what went wrong and what needs to be done so that such a thing can never happen again, even though we know that they are happening again. So it's going to take all of us. That, that's, what, um, that's what the follow through has been. Thank you. Um, next, we have a, a, a question uh, for, for Nesta Fantini uh, from Nora Estrada. Uh, Nora, would you like to ask your questions, please? Um, so, Fantini, um, how do you live with this experience that you have in Argentina? Um, I, I would like to um, repeat her questions uh, for that for the audience. Um, um, so, Nesta Fantini, how do you live with those experiences? What kind of feelings do you have? Hate? Does the hate decreases, or what? What, what are you feeling? Well, like uh, Helen pointed out uh, uh, earlier, I mean, uh, th those experiences, they never go away. They never go away. Uh, they stay with you, in, in my opinion, uh, for the rest of your life. And of course, uh, uh, 
it's so important to move away from the whole idea of revenge, not, not to actually move away from the, uh, the, 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 the experience itself, because I mean, memory is fundamental. We need to get, keep it going, uh, making sure that the, the next uh, generations know what actually happened. Because I mean, there are many, many, many uh, sectors of society still in Argentina that are trying to negate it, that they are in something that's a, 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 it's equivalent to the Holocaust denial. They're trying to say, no, there weren't 30,000 they disappear. No, that was not state terrorism. That was a dirty war. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that it's very important to actually, in my opinion, to be able to overcome the hate that might be there, is to actually talk about what happened and, and make sure that we focus on the facts, that we document as much as possible, like it had been done in Argentina, that they have a very sophisticated system of documentation, including that report that I just did, 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 put in the chat box regarding the CONADEP Commission. So we need to move away from hate. I mean, we need to move towards reconciliation. But again, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the, the perpetrators, the offenders, should not be the charge. That they should be. Uh, held accountable for what they did, and especially we're talking of uh, crimes against humanity. But of course, I mean, there are many emotions in there. I, I've been talking to groups uh, all over the, the US, all over Canada for years now about uh, my experience, but always uh, trying to emphasize that what happened in Argentina is still happening in so many other parts of the world, and that all this uh, issue of uh, incidents of hate and, 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 and crimes of hate, I mean, that we are experiencing here, I mean, are also all over there in all the societies. So that's why it's so important to continue to talk about the past experiences, to understand, I mean, what we should do in the future, like uh, Helen's uh, organization is doing. Huh? And, and, and also to address the whole issue of restitution for African-Americans. Uh, that's a very important point that Professor Taylor made. Huh? And that, uh, it, of course, it's going to become a very controversial issue once, I mean, it's a, uh, Consider the, the the official report by the state assembly, yeah. But uh, again, I think that it's important to actually uh, document, uh, talk about this, uh, to challenge the 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 the, the narrative that's been trying to uh, be imposed by intolerant minds, and and look at the future mainly focusing on the the young people. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Uh, for the emphasis on the documentation on how important it is, because there's a saying that um, if, if it's not recorded, it didn't happen. Um, Professor Taylor, um, when, I, um, when the Queen of England, uh, of Britain, passed away last year, uh, I did a Q&A with um, one of our members, uh, Lyndon Johnson, um, publishers of the, the Career Press. And, and he, he told me that um, the the crime for reparations, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is actually globally uh, because it happened so many places. And the, um, the, the, the sovereigns uh, of, of Britain, uh, you know, if, if you will, uh, have always denied of that. And then um, Lyndon also uh, pointed out to me that they, they're, um, there's some research that actually had unearthed a, an actual document in the British archive that Britain actually we uh, pay back the slave owners for uh, for for giving up the slaves. Um, so um, so um, reparations are given to the, the slave owner, the plantation owners, but 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 not to uh, the people uh, enslaved. So uh, but then uh, our, our point of discussion about reparations within this context is not really about the, the, the money. Of course, money is important, but. It is, it is about uh, regressing uh, uh, an injustice issue that it could happen to uh, any other groups and it should not happen again. So uh, please uh, elaborate more on that. No, thank you. Um, and it's, it, it, it's not about what white people did to black people in all of these histories that are part of the demand for reparations. I've tried on our committee to emphasize state harm, what the state did to the group or to other groups um, and I think that is strategically, 
I think more um, sellable than you know making a, a racial idea. Uh, in fact, even the way California defines uh, eligibility, the California Committee and San Francisco Committee is not based on race. It's based on African American lineage tied to the freedmen, basically, what they called them after Civil War was the freedmen. It's really, California is really adopting a Freedmen's Bureau policy. They're basically saying, bring back the Freedmen's Bureau, which was this entity that the federal government created to help black folk get on their feet after slavery. Um, you know, when you look at, when Queen Elizabeth died, you, there was a lot of, I'm sure some of you saw it online, people pointed out the, the sources of all of the diamonds and jewels on her crown the, the indigenous countries where they were taken from. Um, when the when you mentioned earlier the, the Pope in Canada, you know the Pope came back and apologized after the apology rather, and about three weeks ago or maybe a little bit longer, uh, renounced the doctrine of discovery that was 700 years old. That was the original script, um, and that's a part of I think what we're what we're seeing. Um, anyone that emphasis emphasizes the money. I think is um, really distracted um, by it as the idea, the prejudices of what would these people do with their money? It'll be gone before you know it. It'll be spent. These people won't be responsible. Well, if you if you look at the package we put together, we had 110 recommendations. Money stimulus was just one. The media focused on five million dollars and thankfully they did that because it got us the attention we otherwise hadn't gotten for a year and a half our website had 300 hits for a year and a half on the january 15th when the chronicle published the article about five million dollar recommendation from the san francisco committee we got eight thousand we got thirteen thousand hits in one day um and there was a wide reaction and it actually inspired the state which was originally recommending $300,000 per person to now go up to 1.3 million. And that's what it, where it is right now. Um, and it's not just about the money. What, what, reparations is about the total fixing, the healing, the recovery, the, the fixing of the black community. And I think it's the last frontier for America. I think it's the, I think America's great moment is still ahead of itself. If it did reparations, it would heal this land. It, it would heal this land in a tremendous way. It would heal Black America, the crime, the poverty, the negativity, all of the social problems. How can you look at the, the tenderloin and also be against reparations? If the, if the tenderloin is the hell it is, and it's the fastest growing Black community in San Francisco, well, maybe reparations is the solution. Maybe reparations is the solution to the Black problem because it, it really is attempt to fix economic economic inequality it really came out of apart from the historical movements bernie sanders the occupy movement elizabeth warren those people talked about the disparities in the 2000s as they explained the 99 percent the occupy movement all of that were pre you know preceded to the black group waking up and saying hey after george floyd we need to we need to fix our problems and as we're seeing this rampant crime you know what we're seeing all over this city every major city right now we're fighting for reparations because we know that's the bottom line that will will fix it but again it's not just black america and it's not asking for a handout it's saying fix what you broke and it's actually a global movement um there have been many organizations in place but like you see reparations is not just the outcome people it's like what, what, what Professor um, Fantini is talking about. It's the conversations. It's us talking. It's, it's, you, it's you 94 plus people listening to us talk about the, you know, what people have gone through, their injuries, uh, you know, um, having meetings. The black community of San Francisco, I've avoided it for 20 years and I've been out there for 25 years because it's so divided. But, but since the reparations movement, they've come you know, together and it's happening all over America at the city level and where people are mobilizing uh, because they understand that, again, the, you know, even Juneteenth, Juneteenth now, is it, how did Biden come to that point? Because Black America after George Floyd was in such a, a mood tied to the Tulsa, Oklahoma anniversary of the Tul Tulsa ma massacre of 1921 in 2021. All of that was serendipitous. Um, and the federal recognition of Juneteenth is the first recognition of slavery apart from the 13th Amendment and the war. So 
what we're seeing again, I think uh, it would change the relationship between black America and the police. It would change the relationship between black America and capitalism, black America and white America writ large. Um, and I think it would heal America in ways that nothing else has ever healed it. And for those of us who support King, that we often hear King say that I want my four children to be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Those same people don't hear King say four times in that same speech, when he first starts talking, he says, we have come to, Amer come to Washington DC to cast a check that's been marked insufficient funds. And Martin Luther King, you can Google it, Google Martin Luther King on reparations. You'll see about five different speeches of King explaining reparations without using the word. And I have a dream. He says, we have come here for a check. And he said it bounced. So even King supported reparations. He supported a GI Bill for the poor, Black, white, Puerto Rican, Asian, all together. Most of us know that. But King, King had made a late turn toward the economic focus. Of course, he was afraid of that before but he was making that turn. So I think, again, when you think about um, where we are as a country, I think the disparities research and scholarship, um, there was a book called The Spirit Level uh, written by two British scholars. I don't know if any of you've read that, but it talked, I think the subtitle is, the happier, the more equal countries are, the happier people are, you know, the, the happier they are. And it wasn't advocating socialism, but it was just saying, if you have wide disparities between the haves and have nots, you have all kinds of social maladies. And, uh, and they did this based on uh, statistical measures. You can find it on Amazon, the spirit level. Um, uh, and Professor Labor, uh, uh, Taylor, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, we have ran past the, the hour. Okay. okay. Uh, but, but, um, uh, Julian, uh, Julian, let me let me add only uh, ten seconds that uh, in Argentina uh, we did have a, a, a material restitution and a symbolic reparations. Huh? So the, 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 that that's a very important precedent. That and, and people that went through the similar experiences like the one I, ha I had. I mean, we got the a, a compensation and we also got a, a a pension for life. But more important than that. I mean, we got an apology from the, the National Congress in terms of what we had to experience. Um, to, to, I'll just to say that we have we have one 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 questions that um, can uh, we ask each speaker to to comment on uh, is from uh, uh, Peter Sherman. But uh, in in the interest of time, I'm going to read uh, uh, Peter's questions. Uh, what role does time play in the healing process? We are in the midst. Uh, what feels like a pressure cooker today, can we even consider healing in this kind of political and social climate? I would like to start with Helen. You know, they say that time heals all wounds, but I don't think time, as you can hear from each of the speakers, um, time is not enough. There must be action, there must be learning, there must be, um, we must know the past, acknowledge the past, try to change the past um, so that we don't repeat it in the future. And let me just say that 40 years have gone by since Vincent Chin was killed. In today's climate, the daughter of the judge who sentenced uh, uh, the killers to probation is a, a professor here in San Francisco. And she says that her father actually was an example of restorative justice, of, 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 of not sending killers to jail. And, and I think in today's context, we, th this is another reason why we really must study the past as well, because things can be distorted and used in different ways in today's context. <coughs> I disagree completely that he was an example of that. He was an example of an injustice. However, um, this is why we must know the past, acknowledge it, change things and learn from it so we don't repeat it. That's what we have to do with time. Thank you. Uh, Professor Taylor? Uh, yeah, I think what time is exposed is that this issue, as I said, you know, reparations was the original black politics and then integration came along in 1909. But from the 1890s up until that point, that was the black focus was economic foothold. Of, we needed an economic foundation, kind of like, um, you know, what, what the European immigrants got with the Homestead Act, for example, and King talks about that. Um, time is only exposed that 
the economic front is the, is the, is the last frontier for Black America. Uh, the disparities, for example, of Blacks in San Francisco to the per capita or household income, $100,000 less. So if you're a Black in San Francisco and you're white in San Francisco, $100,000 separates you from each other per capita on average in household incomes. Um, and that didn't come by people being inferior or superior, it came through government initiative, government policies, redevelopment agencies, uh, job, you know, jobs, uh, contracts, access. So I think time is only exposed that the black community through all of the piecemeal efforts that we can talk about from the, you know, the New Deal to the Great Society to welfare, you know, affirmative action, they have not been sufficient because they've all been piecemeal. Reparations would be for blacks, at least on the economic front, a, a, a you know, a, 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 might, a major leap forward. And again, I think it, you know, brings up the whole quality of America. Um, and so time has really exposed that um, no matter what else has happened, um, this, this issue of economic reparations continues to come back. When ta Coates wrote the article after uh, Randall Robinson had wrote the book, The Debt, What America Owes Black People, um, and then it came together with the George Floyd moment. And again, uh, in the backdrop is the disparities that Bernie's campaigns, I think Bernie, even though he didn't support reparations, exposed why reparations was the logic for black folk that came out of what he showed what's happening to students, what was happening to working people, what was happening to poor people. Bernie Sanders doesn't get enough credit because he was not for reparations, but his campaigns brought out the economic pain that all Americans were experiencing, uh, the 99%. And I'm just saying reparations comes out of that 99% in some way in terms of the economic pain. Um, and time has exposed that no matter what else the government has done, this issue continues to come back like a phoenix. Reparations is back again. It's haunting America. And we're having a national conversation about reparations in ways that are mainstream now, where 30, 40 years ago, it was only the black nationalists. It was the militants only. And now it's been brought to the liberal democratic you know, base a uh, center, and now the Democrats have to deal with the problem of reparations because if they don't support it, it's going to backfire on them as a party going forward over the next two elections. The same way the pro, you know, war on drugs Clinton policies of the 90s came back and haunted Hillary in 2016 and suppressed her, unfortunately suppressed her vote by about 4% because the Black Lives Matter movement marched on Hillary, they marched on Bernie, and they reminded Hillary of the old policies of her husband. And I'm saying that Gavin, London, the Democrats, Biden, I've said this everywhere, they have to be careful not to play this thing as if they don't own it um, because black folk are mobilized and the people who are mobilized are political. So they are not going to forget it. So the Democrats have a, a, a real difficult thing to, to deal with, but it's just shown that time has not healed the pain that black folk had in the 1890s. Here we are in the 2020s, still talking about the same issue. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Nestor, uh, you have the last word. Yes, uh, and, uh, and I, in, in general, the terms I agree with Professor Taylor uh, and what uh, Helen also said, uh, in other words, uh, time uh, by itself, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, the, the solution. Uh, I mean, uh, we need a uh, political action. We need to be able to uh, the, generate a change in society. Yeah? So the, the, think about it. And now we are at a very unique moment in history. I mean, with uh, our democratic institutions being threatened, like uh, what we witnessed in January 6th. I mean, if you look at the, the incredible amount of inequality that we have in American society, then we never had the, these levels. Huh? So the, the, the top 20% that controls 90% of the wealth, the, the, in terms of the, the also, the, the whole issue of racial inequality, the, the, the attacks against the AAPI community that we have been discussing, the, the, the reality of also um, the gender the inequality with the, the offensive against the, the LGBTQ community and, and the transgenders in particular. I mean, unless we address those issues and, and we generate a, a much more equal America, if, if, unless we deal with the social, the social justice uh, factor and we can create more the, a, a more fair redistribution of our wealth, I mean, we're going to continue to, to face all of these challenges. 
and, and they're going to come back, like Professor Taylor said. Huh? In Argentina, now we're going back to, the, to some of the issues that were discussed 10, 15 years ago, because some groups, neo-Nazi groups, intolerant groups that are trying to change the narrative. Huh? So unless there is change in society, unless we create a much more tolerant, in, in peaceful society, we're going to continue facing all these challenges. Well, th thank you, all of the speakers. Uh, thank you, Helen, Professor Taylor, and, and Nestor. Um, judging from the, the amount of information and the emotion and the, the passions uh, from the speakers, uh, th this is just truly is a, a topic that we uh, should continue. And I think we just barely scratching the surface. And it's so unfortunate that we don't, uh, we, we lost that right and we don't have a voice from the Native American uh, community. And thank you all the media colleagues and, and everyone who joined this call today. And um, this, um, uh, th uh, this meeting is, um, is over and wish everybody a great, um, uh, a, a happy weekend. Thank you, bye-bye.